And I see you younger generation here in the audience. You did not have to endure those signs. But my generation and older remembers those signs well. And they were very real in Atlanta. The Negro's place could also be seen in the stark realities of Negro jobs, Negro public schools, and the Negro section of town, all separate from white jobs, white schools, and neighborhoods, and distinctly unequal to them. And yet they were crafted by law. Those so-called progressive legal statutes were sanctioned by the Supreme Court, despite the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery, despite the 14th Amendment's guarantee of citizenship, and despite the 15th Amendment's right to vote. The language of the 14th Amendment is clear. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction, to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. It was the 14th Amendment that gave for the first time true meaning to the idea that when black lives matter, all lives matter in America. And yet in less than three decades, the Southern states and the Supreme Court completely undermined the original intent of the 14th Amendment. So in the case Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the court, through its separate but equal doctrine, denied African Americans equal access to virtually all forms of public travel, public accommodations, public schools, public amusements. The lone dissenting Supreme Court justice, there was only one, Justice John Harlan of Kentucky, called out this hypocrisy. And this is what he wrote. We boast of the freedom enjoyed by our people above all other peoples. But it is difficult to reconcile that boast with the state of the law, which practically puts the brand of slavery and degradation upon a large class of our fellow citizens. The thin disguise of equal accommodations will not mislead anyone, nor atone for the wrong done this day. And so he asked the, his fellow justices, why? Why discriminate on race? I mean, using that logic, you could have discriminated on eye color. You could have discriminated on hair color or even religion. And the rest of the court said, but to have done that would have been unreasonable. But it wasn't unreasonable to do this to black people. From a historical perspective, there are comparisons to be made between the goals of the Black Lives Matter today. And by Black Lives Matter, I mean not just the hashtag, but groups today that comprise what many of us think of as the Black Lives Matter movement. There is a way, I think, to compare that larger movement today, largely of young people, and the anti-lynching campaign of the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. And I want to give you three examples from this earlier period. The first was Ida B. Wells. Uh, she would later become Ida B. Wells Barnett. But in 1892, she wasn't married. She was still Ida B. Wells, a young woman, and really a lone voice crying in the wilderness. She is credited for launching the anti-lynching crusade. And she received national and international attention. In 1892, she spoke boldly against lynching, so much so that she was run out of the South, out of her home in Tennessee, with a bounty on her head. The incident that caused her to turn to activism began when her good friend, Thomas Moss, who along with his other two co-owners were lynched because they were co-owners of a store called the People's Store, and it was successful in Memphis. And because they were successful in catering to a black clientele, they were lynched and no one was imprisoned for their murders. 
Now, you may find it interesting to know that Ida B. Wells was criticized by people in her own community, the black community. According, according to her biographer, Paula Giddings, black people, not just whites, not just racist, considered her style abrasive and problematic. In the 1890s, during the high tide of lynching, black leaders, and especially men, criticized her for stirring up more trouble by the graphic imagery that she used. Now remember, this was the Victorian era. And Wells herself recognized and commented upon the indelicacy of this topic and her difficulty as a woman to depict the horrors of lynching without being perceived as unfeminine. But no one else was speaking out with the force that this crime demanded. This is what she says. It is frightful that I should have to discuss such things as these. But my people are being flayed, scourged, hanged, burned, shot, and the sympathy of the world is being turned aside by the hideous charge that we are a bestial race in whose presence womanhood is never safe nor childhood sacred, that our men are unclean brutes. Shall I not tell the whole truth? And so she did. In 1893 and 1894, she traveled throughout England to expose the savagery of lynching in America. She tried to bring global attention to this horrific, and it was a horrific practice. And on the day Wells embarked on her return trip, after she had been over there for over a year, when she came back, she wrote an article that appeared in the New York Age in July 1894. And the title of the article was, Are We a Race of Cowards? In stinging language, she denounced African Americans who doubted or offended, or felt offended by her insistence on telling the ugly truth. And the truth was ugly. Let me quote her. That colored men were roasted, literally burned alive, or lynched in broad daylight, very frequently with the sanction of the officers of the law that half-grown white boys shot bullets into hanging bodies after cutting off toes and fingers of the dead or dying and carrying them away as trophies and souvenirs. And then she goes on to say, you know, people would have easily believed that, believed those kind of atrocities of cannibals or heathens, but not of the American people and in the home of the free and the land of the brave. She was outspoken. And this did not go over well in all parts of the black community. She absolutely felt the resistance of especially black men who denounced her confrontational style, believing her voice on the world stage to be more of a hindrance than a help. And her writings expressed her sense of fighting alone, of her efforts being unappreciated. Black men posed an emotional dilemma for her a sense that her efforts were unwanted. And again, this was the Victorian age, and her raw emotions permeated the news articles she wrote. So let, so let me quote from her in 1894. I am feeling so sorry for myself that the bitter tears have been coursing down my cheeks. I am wondering what a fool am I to sacrifice so much and suffer so much and work so hard for a race that will not defend itself or protect me in defending it. Whose hearts are not stirred to action of some kind on behalf of the victims of lynching, and most of all, I weep because the manhood of the race knows itself slandered, its women and children slaughtered, its mothers, wives, sisters, daughters insulted and despoiled introduced and still fails to assert its strength or extend its protection to those who have the right to claim it. Is mine a race of cowards? Those are her words. Black club women, especially women in these federated clubs in places like Atlanta and New York and Boston, came to her defense and raised the money that she needed to continue her, her struggle. 
Now, the second example um, came later, and this was in the 20th century, the early 20th century, and this was the NAACP. And the NAACP um, began its anti-lynching crusade. It was outraged at the long history of lynching as state-sanctioned violence. And so the NAAC adopted its campaign after it was founded in 1909 and for decades continued this fight. In the year 1919, the NAACP published a book. It was called 30 Years of Lynching from 1889 to 1918. And the book begins this way. The United States has for long been the only advanced country where government has tolerated, nation, tolerated lynching. And this was a book that was fact-driven. It was a study substantiated by evidence from newspapers and confirmed by investigators. And the facts came in no small measure from the white press itself in the Jim Crow South because white newspapers advertised upcoming lynchings and featured photographic images of them. The NAACP study contained statistics on persons lynched. It included their names, a state-by-state -state distribution of people lynched each year, and to win allies, the NAACP collected evidence to reveal the many types of persons who fell victims to this extrajudicial killing of black men, women, and children, some of whom who had simply said the wrong thing to a white person or were financially successful, like Ida B. Wells' friend in Memphis. Some black people were lynched if they challenged being cheated by the landlord in the share crop system or refused to sit in a Jim Crow car, or who were in consensual and loving relationships across the color line. A person did not need to have committed a violent act to be lynched. And even if this were the case, even if an act of violence did occur, the accused perpetrator deserved a trial by jury. The key here is the state's role in the perpetuation of this violence. But the NAACP did more than simply gather statistics and write books about this. It had widespread publicity campaigns. The NAACP raised a flag outside its building in Harlem at crucial moments to alert people. And this flag said, a man was lynched yesterday. The NAACP held mass marches like that of the thousands who marched silently in 1917 in Harlem. They worked with black Boy Scouts to disseminate literature on lynching. They worked with black women's clubs, with black theater, and in many venues to call attention to this terrible problem in America. And importantly, their actions took them to the halls of Congress, with the NAAC pushing for anti-lynching laws. The first attempt was called the Dyer Bill, and it came up in 1918, and there would be others in the 1930s and the 1940s. Only three of those bills passed in the House of Representatives. None ever made it through the Senate. The Southern senators filibustered, and thus no anti-lynching bill ever became federal law. And I want to emphasize that the anti-lynching legislation that the NAACP sought was not simply directed against mobs or vigilantes. It was also worded in such a way that called specific attention to law and for enforcement's role, to the police, to the role of the police in failing to ensure trial by jury. Some police would indicate when a person would be transported to a prison or from a prison to the court, thus indicating it's opportune time to bring your posse and to lynch and participate in a lynching. The failure of the federal government to take a stand against lynching was a blatant injustice. And this injustice was allowed to occur so often without any indictments against the perpetrators because of the widespread opinion that black men, women, and children were somehow different and more threatening in society. Now the third example in the struggle against the debilitating effects of racism on black lives is the work of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. 
Asala, which was founded in 1915 at the same time that these other groups are being founded by the historian Carter G. Woodson. Asala fought a battle against the violence perpetrated against the, the minds and intellects of men and women and boys and girls. Because this idea of the Negro's place spoke not only to the tangible and visible realms, it spoke to more than where people could go. It also spoke to their consciousness, to public opinion, to religious belief, to standards of beauty. It was a body of knowledge that located and assigned black people within America's racial order according to a hierarchy that positioned them below all other groups. And in 1903, in the famous Souls of Black Folks, Du Bois famously captured this intangible realm when he wrote, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with a second sight in this American world, a world that yields him no true self-consciousness Think about that, no real consciousness of yourself, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. And this is a, a world that despises. It was indeed a challenge then to perceive oneself with pride and dignity, to perceive one's race with pride, given the larger American culture and its message of black inferiority, which was promoted through newspapers, art, film, literature, advertisements, children's games, and not least of all, school books. And so Asala's founder, Carter G. Woodson, wrote this, to handicap a student by teaching him that his black face is a curse, and this, his struggle to change his condition is hopeless, is the worst sort of lynching. And so he saw a mental lynching. He saw the need for teaching black people their history. And this is what he goes on to say. I quote him again. If you teach the Negro that he has accomplished as much good as any other race, he will aspire to equality and justice without regard to race. And that effort would upset the program of the oppressor. And Asala continues that effort to this very day. Our theme this year is the crisis in black education. And we are meeting in September. I hope that all of you will come to Cincinnati in September when we meet and have panels that talk about the crisis in black education and also the ways, the many ways of programs in schools and outside of schools where we are trying to address that crisis. I believe that when black lives matter, all lives will matter. But I also believe that this statement needs a corollary statement. And the corollary goes like this. When black lives matter, all lives will matter in the black community. And this statement targets more than black life in regard to police, in regard to police violence. And in fairness to the Black Lives Matter movement, they are focused on more than just police violence. But I do feel the need to say that when black lives matter, all lives must matter in the black community because we as a people need a vigorous campaign for justice that targets black on black violence. We need a more energized and concerted struggle against the poverty against the unemployment and the poor schools and the lack of political voice and other conditions that contribute to crime in our cities. Medical, psychiatric, and family counseling, all these services must play a role against crime. We cannot stay silent or passive in regard to any acts, be they external or internal to the black community that demean or destroy black lives. We need a more energized and concerted struggle against, the, against these forces. We need medical and family counseling. We need mentoring. And in this way, churches have the potential to be a potential force for improving life 
in our cities. And organizations like Asala and many, many organizations that work with young people will be crucial to this effort. And there's no question in my mind that the system of the law enforcement and of the courts and of the criminal laws at the state level and federal levels must undergo change. They have to. And I am heartened to see the protests by today's younger generation of activists who are speaking to these problems. Their important work should continue and not be faulted for failing to do all the other varied types of work in need of doing by all of us. The new Jim Crow must be met by a new civil rights movement. Just like in the 1960s, when there were many organizations, there, was, or there were the NAACP, the National Urban League, the SCLC, CORE, SNCC, the Black Panther Party, to name only some of the national groups, as well as countless organizations at the local level. And, and I will concede that some of these organizations competed against one another, and some of them didn't like one another. But each seemed to be committed to a particular aspect of the civil rights agenda and carved out its programs, be it litigation for access to edu education, or litigation breaking down uh, segregated public accommodations, or mass marching for free access, or voter registration, or free breakfast programs, or health clinics. I cannot overstate the importance of a great ground swell across the generations, across all of us. People making a difference in multiple ways and making that difference without privileging or thinking that there's only one way or only one type of organization or only one type of personal style to make Black Lives Matter. I'd like for you to think of the model of the Montgomery bus boycott. And this bus boycott lasted over a year, but in the end it was victorious. It was an umbrella organization, something called the Montgomery Improvement Association. And this organization led and sustained the boycott. But what, what's important, it, important is that it brought together a variety of discrete organizations. It brought together fraternities and sororities, teachers and cab drivers, the NAACP, women's clubs, grandparents, college students, many groups in Montgomery, Alabama. Today, a new civil rights movement is needed, and it must include groups as diverse as Black Lives Matter, and a church mentoring program for youth, and a job program for the re-entry of former incarcerated men and women into society. Even before the presidential election of Donald Trump, but especially afterward, I have heard some people say, in great frustration, and we've all said, with a sense of cynicism at times, and with a sense of helplessness that it just remains to be seen. It just remains to be seen what will happen. And I understand this frustration. But I want to discourage us and I include myself from that kind of passive thinking. Instead, we should say, we remain to be seen. We remain to be seen, to be a visible presence in our communities and in coalitions with other communities that strategically work toward the goals of justice and equality for people of, of all races, ethnicities, genders, sexualities, religions, because when black lives matter, all lives will matter. If you were asked to name the most important effort needed in our struggle to assure fairness in this society, how would you answer? Would you single out voting, political voice? Would you identify education or employment? Would you identify improved living conditions, health, Fairness from the police, fairness in the courts. I hope this list 
lets you know the urgency to tackle all of these issues, not merely one of them. And it may seem to some people, maybe even some of you in this audience, that such a task is too great, that the black freedom struggle has gone on far too long to still be unfinished, even after the two-term election of America's first black president. And I'm sure that there are some of you who just feel like quitting and just taking care of yourself. But I leave you with this thought. The history of our people, of our long freedom struggle from the days of slavery to the present has always proclaimed that our lives matter. Thus, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you. <laughs>